Initiation by Elizabeth H. Chapter 7. The Red Man. At the age of nine, I was greatly shaken by an experience which stands out starkly in my memory. My little brother, whom I loved dearly, was just two. He fell sick, but our doctor could not diagnose the cause of his suffering. I was in the room where he was lying in bed, with mother sitting beside him. All of a sudden, the child started up out of a sound sleep, wide-eyed with fright, as it stared in the direction of the door and called out, Mother, Mother, the red man, the red man is coming to get me. The child waved his tiny hands as if he were fighting someone off, and then screamed at the top of his lungs, Mother, help, the red man, and fell over in a faint. Mother sprang up, caught him in her arms, laid him gently back into bed, and immediately sent for the doctor. While we were waiting, I asked, Mother, who was this red man that he saw? Mother answered, Nothing real, darling. He's just seeing things, hallucinations, in his fever. When the doctor came, he found the child had pneumonia. Poor dear mother, three weeks long, she carried the child day and night in her arms, not sleeping, not leaving him for a moment. I was aghast as I watched the fearful struggle my brother was making for his life, and my mother was making to save her only son. It was perhaps the first time in my life that I opened my heart all the way for my mother, and perhaps it was the first time in my life that I saw that through and through her heart was made of a fabric of love. I, too, lived through this period in fear and trembling for the life of my brother, and from this time on, I felt I really belonged to my family. When he finally returned to health, I took my full part in the family rejoicing. At last, I'd begun to feel at home in this place, but I did not forget the red man. Mother tried to reassure me in vain that it had not been something real. My brother had seen him. Something had caused him to see a red man, and that was not supposed to be something real. What my brother had seen remained an open question for me. One I pondered long and often, and at that time I could not dream that I would someday, many, many years later, find the answer in India. A year later, we moved to another part of the city where there were many trees and where the houses were surrounded by beautiful gardens. From the windows of our new home, we could look out in every direction towards the hills and the mountains. I went back to school and once again the old story began for me. The other girls in school were amazed at me as I was at them. They played with dolls and that just bored me stiff and I read books and they thought I, and I read books they thought were just as dull. The older I grew, the more feverishly I read. Not only the books we children received, but all the books in my father's library. There I found a set of volumes which caused me to begin reading even more avidly than I had before. The Complete Works of Shakespeare. I devoured one book after another. They made such a profound impression upon me that I just could not stop reading. All day long I could think of nothing else. I acted like a sleepwalker. At mealtimes I did not even hear what people said to me. I was still reenacting the fate of the hero and the heroine of a particular tragedy or comedy that I had just been reading. First I read all the tragedies one after another living in a deep state of emotional turmoil. And then came the comedies, which kept me rocking back and forth on our sofa out of pure amusement. Along with Shakespeare, there was another th set of thick books entitled Ethnographical Research, which meant much to me. There I found descriptions of all kinds of rituals in the field of superstition and black magic. In these volumes, I read things that were startlingly new and difficult to understand. Superstitions about love, 
recipes for brewing love potions and other obscure rites having to do with love and sex. After spending quite some time reading some of the most fantastic things, I fired some questions at Mother. Mother, I asked, can you make someone love you by taking a yellow turnip, boring a hole through it from top to bottom, spitting through the hole three times, and then taking the turnip out at midnight and throwing it over the house of the person you love. Is it true that you can take a piece of a girl's nightdress, burn it, and bake the ashes in a cake? The person who eats the cake will fall in love with the girl who owns the nightdress and do anything else she wants him to. Mother, let me finish asking questions. While the expression on her face changed from amazement to horror, finally she burst out, Oh, for goodness sakes, where did you hear all this terrible nonsense? Have you been talking to the washwoman? How often have I forbidden you to talk over delicate questions with the cook or the washwoman? Where have you heard all this fearful black magic nonsense? Tell me right away. Mother, I answered, supremely certain of my innocence. Don't get excited. These things cannot be so fearful if a scientist spends his time investigating them. I read them in scientific books, in the ethnographical research books in Father's library. That was enough to set Mother scurrying to Father's bookcase, which she promptly locked, <laughs> withdrawing the key and keeping it. And from then on, I was allowed to read only what she gave me in order to obtain otherwise inaccessible information. I asked Mother from time to time to let me have a volume of the encyclopedia, which to read up on some plant or animal that we were studying in school. And I saw to it that this volume contained a, the particular word that interested me much more than the plant or animal. Then I went into the children's room and thoroughly studied the things I wanted to know. Thus, with Mother's express permission and assistance, I read item after item of prohibited information, <laughs> while Mother lived on in a blissful ignorance of the true objects of my attention. Even better, Mother herself had tipped me off to the fact that I could learn all kinds of exciting things from, about superstition from our washwoman. <laughs> As fast as I possibly could, I sought out opportunities for clandestine conversation with her. Thus, I came to hear some of the most horrible stories about ghosts, superstitions, and witchcraft, until I got into such a state of fear that I no longer dared enter a dark room alone. Then Uncle Steffi asked me once why I was afraid. Because I might see a ghost, I said. Oh, so that's it. I want to know an easy way. Oh, want to know an easy way to defend yourself? Just whistle real loud and all the ghosts will scamper away instantly. From then on, I was constantly whistling <laughs> while at the same time delving further into ghost stories. Thus, on the one hand, I extended my knowledge about the lowest levels of mysticism and on the other, developed an above-average ability for whistling. <laughs> and that was Chapter 7. Chapter 8 is entitled, My Future Appears. Till soon.